Hi, everybody. My name is Joey Lin, and I'm the resident test preparation expert here at Think Prep. I've taken the SAT and ACT multiple times, and I've gotten a perfect 1,636 multiple times as well. I've even had a few students get perfect scores on their SAT and ACT. So today in front of me, I have the December 2020 copy of the ACT. It's form D03, and I haven't seen any of the questions before, so I thought this would be a really good opportunity to kind of work through the section, seeing everything for the first time, and having you hear my thoughts out loud as I try to walk through this test. Um, I know there are probably gonna be questions that you may, may have, because I'll be going through this kind of quickly. So if you have any, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll do my best to answer each question. So without further ado, let's get started. So what do we have here? Um, we have question one, which is asking, the study was most likely designed to answer which of the following questions about squirrel behavior. Let's see, I'm gonna look at the variables. So I see different types of trees, acorn types, undamaged, infested, shelled, um, and then they're measuring percent of acorns. Okay, I'll always make sure I note percent because they love those questions. Um, then it's asking average distance traveled. So this is distance and then more trees and then caching and eating. Okay. So does the presence of insect larva uh, protein, these are two random variables. It's probably not gonna be that one. Are squirrels more likely to reject acorns that are infested or shelled? Okay, I see those words, yep. Um, does the percentage of acorns cached by squirrels vary from season to season? Okay, they're not measuring season either. So I don't think it's that one. Are squirrels more likely to travel greater distance during the morning? I see distance, but I don't see morning or afternoon, so I'm pretty sure it's not that one. Um, so the one that is most likely is going to be B, that has direct variables mentioned in the passage or the graphs. Which of the following factors was held constant during the study? Okay, constant. Well, percentage of acorns was not constant. That was being measured over here. Time of day, order in which the acorns were presented distance travel before eating so it's not that one either because that one's distance and then usually constant is going to be somewhere at the beginning the study was conducted over 75 consecutive autumn days um, beginning at the same time of each morning 225 acorns were placed one at a time beginning at the same time each morning scientists began placing them each of the nine acorn types was presented an equal number of times and the order in which the acorns were presented was random so the order was random and then the time of day was constant okay g which of the following statements about pin oak acorns is consistent with the study pin oak, pin oak, pin oak. okay so these three what does it say shelled pin oak acorns were eaten eaten more frequently than infested shell slightly lower so 64 to 68 not that one um shelled pin oak acorns were rejected rejected less frequently than undamaged rejected less frequently than undamaged more frequently so it's not that one um undamaged pin oak acorns and infested pin oak acorns were cached undamaged and infested okay these two were cached 24 yep it's probably that one and undamaged Pin oak acorns were cached 64%. Nope, it says 24% of the time, so we know that it's C. Um, according to table two, before eating shelled red oak acorns, the squirrels traveled a distance of according to table two. So here's table two, making sure that we get our table shelled red oak uh, before eating. So 15, that should be pretty easy. Which of the following statements comparing the distances squirrels travel before eating infested acorns to the distance they travel before caching is supported by table two? Okay, so they want us to compare eating to caching. And it looks like if we look, the one on the right is always greater than one on the left. So on average, the distance traveled before eating was farther. Eating was farther than the distance. That's true. Caching was farther. Nope, that's false. Eating was farther. Yep, caching was farther. Okay, so let's see what's different in the second half. Um, the distance traveled before caching for infested red oak acorns and then white oak. Oop. 
Oh, <laughs> there's a trick there. They chose the wrong plants. Red oak acorns. Okay. Assume that the more perishable a given type of acorn, the more likely a squirrel is to eat the acorn rather than to catch it. So the more likely it is to eat, so I'll draw an upward arrow here. And then the less likely it is to catch, so I'll draw a downward arrow there. Consider the results in table one for the shelled red oak acorns. Okay, so we want the shelled red oak acorns in table one, so it's this one. And based on the results, what is the order of the three acorn types from most perishable to least perishable. So since perishable and eat are in the same direction, I want most eaten to least eaten. Uh, shelled red oak is 60 eaten. Uh, infested pin oak is 68. Okay, 60, 68. And then least, what's the third one? Undamaged white oak. Okay, so 88. So 60, 68. 60. So most to least. So it'd be undamaged first, uh, infested second, okay, and then shelled third. So it's J. Um, so yeah, okay, I think that's it. Um, and then number seven says of the 1875 undamaged pin oaks, um, the number of those that were cached by squirrels is closest to which of the following? Um, 1875, undamaged, pin oak, cash, 24. 24, this is a percent, right? So we're going to do 24% of 1875. So that's the same as basically dividing it by 4. So I'll divide it by 4. Plus 10, 27, 27, 27, 27 plus 6, 24, 35, 8, 468. Closest to 475. Okay. I think that's it. Okay. Next one looks like we have some periodic tables, and it says based on table one as the group two A elements as the atomic mass increases to A, atomic mass increases. We're going to look at specific heat. Specific heat looks like it's going down. Okay, perfectly going down. Just double checking. Yep, so increase, decrease, up and down. According to table one at 298, the specific heat of indium. Is closest to which of the following values? Specific heat, indium, indium. Okay, right there. Specific heat is 233. Uh, and they want us to compare to barium is 204. Uh, calcium, calcium is 647. Okay, so it's definitely not that one. Um, strontium, SR, 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 306. And then TL, 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 thallium. Okay, so this one's closest to which one? So, 129 is about 100, 204 is 30, 70, so 204 is barium, 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 okay. Um, based on the definition of thermal conductivity and on table 1, does strontium or thallium conduct more heat effectively? Okay, we want the definition of thermal conductivity uh, here. Ability to conduct heat, the greater the thermal conductivity, the more effectively it conducts heat. Okay, so we want the greater thermal conductivity then. Um, strontium, thallium, strontium, thallium, strontium, thallium, strontium, and thallium. We want this one's greater, this one's greater. So strontium is greater, so it's... No, I got it backwards. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thallium. Thallium is greater. The thermal conductivity is greater than that of strontium. Greater, greater, not less than. Greater. Whew. Close call there. Okay, 11. Neither table 1 nor figure 1 gives the thermal conductivity of magnesium at which it wants temperatures. Okay, table 1, magnesium, thermal conductivity, which temperature? Oh, I see temperatures, 298. So it's definitely not D. Okay, and then I don't see any other temperatures, so let's go down to figure 1. Magnesium is the dotted line there. Temper oops, temperatures on the x-axis, and all these temperatures are tested. So anything from zero to a hundred. Let's see. So cancel, cancel. Um, two hundred. Not tested. Not tested. Right. Neither. Um, based on Figure One, at which of the following temperatures is the thermal conductivity of Al closest to Mg? Al is the solid. Mg is the dotted one. 
one are they closest? No, they're farthest apart, 30. Oh, they're just getting closer. So anything that that's high, right? So this is 80. So yep, definitely going to be that one. Um, and then which of the following is the meaning of the density for indium density? Density is mass over volume, right? So the density of indium is 7.31 density grams per centimeters. And then if you ever have a, a formula that has a ratio in its unit, it could be written like this. So for every one centimeter cubed, each centimeter cubed, so these are wrong, each one centimeter cubed has a mass, not a volume. So it's a mass, mass over volume for density. Oh, that wasn't too bad. What's going on here? Let's look at these just to mark them up really quickly. So, what are they measuring? They're measuring latitude, increasing latitude, increasing mod, increasing speed, decreasing mod, increasing latitude, increasing speed. Okay. And then 14 says, suppose that in experiment two, the students had launched the ball at a speed of 33. Experiment two, 33. Okay. And I see between. So that makes it pretty easy. I'm just trying to find a number between those two numbers. That's pretty easy. That's called interpolation. According to the results of experiment one, as latitude increased, the mod increased also. Let me just double check to make sure everything's consistently increasing. Yep, that one's pretty easy. 16. Based on the results of experiment three, which of the following graphs best shows the relationship between latitude and minimum speed required to avoid collision. Experiment three is this stuff over here. And I see up, up as well. So that makes it pretty easy. Look, only one of the graph has a direct correlation. So it's J. 17. The students made certain to use the same ball in both experiments one and two. The students most likely did this to ensure that the ball's mod would be. Okay, experiment two. In experiment two, they're measuring the mod, so they don't want it to be the same for each trial. And the other thing is they, they're talking about a control variable here. So you use a control variable to not have it impact your results. So you don't want your results to be the same. You don't want it to be different. You just want it to be unaffected. That's the purpose of a control variable. So what do we want it to be unaffected by? The variations of the object's shape or mass, that makes sense? Unaffected by variations of the launch speed or latitude. Well, launch speed and latitude, it looks like, are the independent variables. So we do want it to be affected, right? That's the whole purpose of a scientific experiment. We want the independent to control or affect the dependent, and we want the control variable to avoid confounding. 18, it says based on the results of experiment two by how many millimeters? Okay, we're going to look out for that. Did the mod decrease when the launch speed was increased from 15 to 20? Uh, experiment two down here, launch speed was increased from 15 to 20. Okay, so 15 to 20, and they want the increase, and this is centimeters. Okay, centimeters to millimeters means we're going to times it by 10. So this is 20. I can't see it here. Let me erase it. Okay, 2.58. 2.58 is going to be 25.8 then. If we times it by 10, we just move the decimal place over once and then 17.2. Okay, so then we want the difference. So 6, uh, okay, the 115, 8.6, 8.6. Oh, that's nice of them. We didn't even need to convert. I think even if you didn't convert, you could have gotten the answer right. Um, 19 says, suppose that in experiment one, a trial had been performed in which a ball had been launched at a speed of 25 at 45 degrees south. Okay, they italicized this experiment one. Oh, okay, I see this north. Aha. This trial would most likely have resulted in the ball deflecting too. Okay. We've got to look probably at the beginning then to see what the heck happens with north and south. Uh, however, because the earth rotates, the Coriolis effect causes the object to be deflected either to the right of the expected path in the northern hemisphere or to the ooh to the left of the expected path in the southern hemisphere. Um this is totally from a Simpsons episode. Bart goes to Australia and he goes because the toilet water is going the wrong way. So I, that's what they're testing here. Wait, so something what are they launching though? Okay, but either way, it's being launched to the 
left of the expected path. Okay, so balls go different ways in the southern hemisphere, I guess. So in the north, okay, 45, 2.06. So this is an equal and opposite question. It's going to be 2.06. It's just going to go in a different direction uh, to the left. Equal and opposite. It's a physics concept. Okay, number 20. Which of the following best summarizes the procedures of experiment three? The students, what? They're measuring latitude. The procedures, though. Procedures, the table three would be the result. So procedures means I have to read the beginning. Um, they performed five trials, each at different latitudes. Okay, in each trial, they repeatedly launched two identical disks. Each four centimeters in diameter. Okay, I see centimeters in the answer. So something about centimeters. Directly towards one each other at identical speeds across a 200 meter long frictionless table. The speed was adjusted for each launch until the students had determined the minimum launch speed required. Okay, so you have these two balls. Repeatedly adjust. To just avoid colliding. Okay, I see, okay, adjust. Okay, I see the word adjusted mentioned a bunch. Okay, I see it. The speed was adjusted. The speed was adjusted. Oh, this is tricky because you're not repeatedly adjusting the latitude. You can't adjust the latitude. Um, and then the mod. Well, the mod is all really small. In this graph. So I think they did the 200 centimeters to throw you off because that's it's a 200 meter long table. And then two diameter. Okay, so diameter, if diameter is four, that means radius is two. So yeah, I think process elimination leads you to F. Yeah, okay, so that one's F. Okay, I'm gonna take a lozenge. It's hard talking for this long. I think that's right. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. It says, according to figure two, if an individual increased dietary consumption of vitamin D from one times to two times, what the relative blood concentration? Okay, so on figure two, the individual dietary vitamin D3, where's D3? D3 is right here, one time to two times. Would it increase? Well, no, the graph is flat, so no. No. And then it wouldn't decrease, it's just steady, it just remained the same. Okay, that's not bad. According to figure three, the relative blood CT concentration between five and six times normal within which of the following CA2 plus concentration range. According to figure three, relative blood CT, CT, y axis, okay. Five and six, five and six, okay. So there's just always between five and six from here to going to here. It stops there. I guess it stops here. So this is what it stops doing that around like nine, maybe. So between eight and nine, yeah. Because 10, 11, 12, 13, it's all like dropped. So it's none of these. Okay. According to figure one, what activates the conversion of CD to CT? According to figure one, CD to CT. Okay, figure one, figure one, CD, CT. Something's causing it's the kidney. Oh, there's this key. Inhibition, ooh, activation, activation, brown, black arrow. Okay, yeah, PTH. The PTH up here. CD is. Yeah, it says it in the passage too. It's a reaction that requires. It doesn't say activate. Okay, whatever. It's PTH. Um, according to figure three, when an individual's blood CD concentration is a normal value, you want the CA2 concentration. Uh, star. They're nice here. Okay. Normal value. Normal value. Just draw a line over to the graph. Looks to be like nine-ish, right? Close to ten. 
9.5. Okay, that's easy. According to figure two, the greatest variation. Okay, variation means we want like big change. In relative blood CD concentration occurs when the dietary consumption of D3 is in with, within which of the following ranges? Figure two. Uh, it varies the most here in this little range right there. So something low, close to zero. Okay, close to zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Zero to 0 0.2.5, because then here it stops, right? So it flattens out by that point. And then all these, yeah, they're all flat here. So opposite of variation, constant. 26, it says according to the given information, the inhibition of the conversion of D3 to CD. So inhibition is, you know, information is usually at the beginning. Inhibition of the conversion of D3 to CD. D3 to CD. Inhibition D3. First, vitamin D3 is converted to CD in the liver. That's not the inhibition, though. Inhibition means stopping. An elevated concentration of CD inhibits further, uh, that's pretty easy, inhibits an elevated concentration of CD. Uh, okay. Not too bad. This is all in the passage. According to the given information, that makes it so nice. Just in the passage. Interesting. Physics. Okay. I can do physics. Just checking if there's a question there. Uh, physics is usually the easiest because you can just kind of see what the variables do. So in this case, what is going on? This is case, this is steady. My is going up. Force is going up. Time is going down. Going up, up, down. Okay. And then look at how they grouped it too. In each of the studies, and just in general, MX is going up as well. Um, so they grouped it into a bunch of different studies here. And then we have acceleration going up, going up, going up as well. So acceleration is going up. Uh, 27, the speed of block Y can be attained using this equation. Yeah, that's an obvious equation. So the speed of block Y at the time it struck the platform in trial two. Okay, so in trial two. Okay, so we need the speed and the acceleration. Speed, 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 speed. No, we're looking for speed. Time. Okay, 0.96. Trial two. Six, and then we need the acceleration. Uh, acceleration is down here, trial two. 3.27. Cool. And I think actually knowing this equation is sometimes useful. You might have to have it memorized. So B. Which of the following statements is consistent with the available information about the design or the procedure of the studies? More trials were performed in study two. Uh, 10 and 10. Nope, 10. In each trial, the block of mass X was less than or equal to the block of mass Y. Yeah, that's true, less than or equal to. Um, the results of study two were unrelated. Well, well why would you have unrelated studies? Uh, it says the acceleration in each trial study one was then calculated. So then shows that it was related. So no, there was only one trial that involved testing blocks of equal mass. No, one, two, three, four, there's four. Okay, so it's G. Suppose that in study one, a trial had been formed, performed in which block Y was pulled down and then released when block X was 1.5 meters above the platform. So I need to dissect that. So suppose means something changed. Okay, here's the picture. So ooh, right now block Y is 1.5 and then we're going to pull this one down. Okay, we pull this one down. So if we pull this one down, then obviously that means this one will go up then. And so, further, suppose that in this trial, MX was 0.8 and MY was 0.6. The force on the trial would be most likely which of the following. Okay, I think this is another equal and opposite question because you're just switching the order of things around, right? You just pull block Y down. Um, yeah, because look here somewhere. It says block X was pulled down and held in place. So you're pulling block X down. Okay. But if you pull block Y down, it'll have the same tension just in reverse. So eight and six, eight and six, eight and six. Okay. Eight and six. So if we switch it, it'll still be the same tension. Where's the tension? 
I guess this is the tension. Is this F the tension? Is the F the tension? Do they say? What the heck? Where is F? Gosh. I mean, I don't want to assume. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Spring scale, measure forces. So yeah, that's the tension. Newtons. Yeah, and it says Newtons here. Okay. So 7 is the closest. Suppose that in step three, block X had been pulled down and held in place so the block Y was 100 centimeters, not meters, above the platform. So block Y would be much closer than so, like down to here. Um, which would the values of T record in study one most likely be greater or less? Well, what is T? T is the time required for block Y to fall to the platform. No, if you move it closer to the platform, it's going to require less time to fall. Less time. Less. Less fall on a shorter distance, J. Um, based on the results of the studies for a given value of mx, as my was increased due to the following variables, f t a also increased. Well, good thing I drew these arrows, right? As my increased, f also increased, and then a also increased. So f and a t did not count. T does not count. Cross out all the t's. Oh, that makes it easy. T decreased. Um, that's why I do that early on in the passage. Um, based on the description of study one, was my dependent variable or independent variable? Um, well, all the numbers are nice and clean, so it's probably independent. It's also on the left of the table, right? We're not measuring it. We put it there on purpose. So. Because in each trial, its value was intentionally set. Yes, intentionally. So it was obtained. That's the definition of a dependent variable. So that would have become F and G. So it's not F, it's H. Consider any trial in which the block masses were not equal. In this trial, block X had been released. The gravitational potential energy of Y immediately began to, well, Y is falling. Gravitational potential energy is dependent on the mass, the gravity due to acceleration. The acceleration due to gravity gives me the height. So because the height is going down, the GP is also going down. This is just something that you do need to know. Um, decrease because block Y began to lose height. Yeah. Okay, so this is physics. I'm familiar with physics, so that did definitely help me. Um, for those of you who aren't, you can still get six out of the seven pretty easily, assuming there are seven questions. Uh, okay, my favorite, the reading one. Yay. Okay, so what I normally do in the reading one is I'm going to just make a big old table here and then just start taking notes, taking notes, taking notes. Student one, student two, student three, student four. Okay, what are they saying? Uh, the chemical formula water is H2O, okay. H2O is heated, the chemical bonds between the H and the O. Okay, so heat, so heat, and then the bonds break, um, leaving individual H and O atoms. So here's an H and here's an O atom. The H atoms dissolve, okay, so H atoms dissolve in the remaining water while O atoms combine, so O plus O is equal to O2. The breakdown of water, we can just copy that formula later. Uh, because O2 is a gas, it forms bubbles, and the bubbles contain O2 only, okay. Number two, student one is correct, okay, of course, they normally have one of that. Uh, However, so this is correct, and this breakdown is correct. However, the H atoms do not dissolve, so no dissolve. Um, rather, they combine, okay, so it's H plus H is equal to H2 also, um, because O2 and H2 are gases. Okay, so O2 and H2 are gases. The bubbles form contain a mixture. So they're talking about bubbles. They're all arguing about bubbles here. Student three, the chemical bonds in the water do not break. Okay, so this one says break. Okay, break. So not break. Instead, water molecules form new chemical bonds called hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. Okay. That's totally not true, but sure. With other water molecules. Okay. As more and more hydrogen bonds form a thin circular sheet of hydrogen bonded water molecules. Okay. And the sheet comes in contact with the surface of the water. 
Okay, I don't even know what's going on. The air pushes down, causing a it to bow in the middle and close up on itself, causing a spherical bubble. I don't know. I just used the picture. It's as, so for arguing the bubbles, the bubbles are air. Okay, so it's very confusing picture. Um, Soon for as the water is heated, chemical bonds are neither broken. Okay, not broken. Not formed. Okay, so that means student three is saying it is formed. I think, yeah, it is talking about formed. Okay. Uh, instead, the water molecules absorb heat energy. Is that possible? I guess so. I'm not the best at chemistry, but I think that's possible. And then the energy is converted to kinetic energy. Okay, that's true. Heat is a synonym of kinetic energy. Once the kinetic energy reaches a certain threshold, the water begins to change from the liquid phase of the gas phase, forming bubbles that contain water vapor only. Okay, so this is saying H2O vapor. Okay, I think that should be enough. I should read the beginning too. A science teacher poured 400 milliliters of water in a beaker and heated the beaker with a Bunsen burner. After a few minutes, bubbles began to form and float to the surface. Oh. Oh, it's not even this crazy thing. They're just Boiling water. Huh. Okay. 34. Based on the description of the demonstration, were the bubbles that were formed more dense? Uh, well, the bubbles are floating, right? Yeah, float. It says float up there. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Floating means they're less dense. Um, more dense means sinks. Uh, and then it didn't sink, right? It didn't sink. It didn't sink. It didn't sink. Um, 35. During the demonstration, the bubbles are observed to form well below the water surface. This information directly contradicts. Who said the water forms, the bubbles form at the surface? Um, I didn't write surface. Shoot. Um, um, they don't mention anything. Hmm. Surface, okay. Surface. So yeah, okay, I get it. The okay, it's saying like this thing rises to the surface and then it like forms a bubble. Okay. Student three didn't get much sleep last night. Um, which of the following states are implied that bubbles contain gas molecules? Uh, all of them, right? Gas. 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 Gas, yeah. All of them. According to students 1, 2, and 3, the process of bubble formation in water involves which of the following changes? Okay, well, number 1 says they're broken. 1 and 2 say broken. But then 3 says. They aren't broken, uh, but none of them mention kinetic energy, so I don't think it's those two. I guess, yeah, they're 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 combining here and they're combining here, and then, yeah, for sure it's. Oh, this is tricky. Yeah, I don't think it's broken because do not break. Yeah. Okay. It has to be. Yeah, it has to be that one. Okay, that one's kind of confusing. And then 38, suppose that after the students gave the responses, the teacher filled a balloon with H2 and O2. Where this supposed the balloon that she held a lit candle, the balloon, then the balloon exploded. Okay, so that's heat. Based on this information, which is student two or four, if either would likely claim that an explosion would occur during the original demonstration. An explosion would have occurred during the original demonstration. The teacher had a lit, held a lit candle above the surface of the water. I don't think there's an explosion here for so not student two. And then Would student four have claimed? Uh, I don't know. Let me skip that one. Um, 39, which student's explanation is the most scientifically accurate? Well, she's just boiling water, so that's just water vapor. Forms. 
pretty easy. Just changing the state of matter. Um, and then 40 is which of the following balance chemical equations best in light of the student two's explanation. Um, yeah, forming gases. So water broken into gas. Yeah, that's not water. That's hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so that's that one. So back to this one. Okay. Chemical bonds are neither broken nor formed. Instead, the water molecules absorb the heat energy and is converted into kinetic energy. Once the kinetic energy reaches a certain threshold, the water begins to change phase. It would be more likely to claim that an explosion would have occurred than not. I don't think either of them would have. Right? Because it's saying it'll just like, it wouldn't explode, it would just boil. Okay, so it's just going to be J. That was a little bit confusing too. Um, yeah, I think that's my time. So, yeah, that's it. Um, I'm pretty sure I did most of these right because I think I found evidence for each of the questions. Um, but if I missed any, I will definitely do a follow-up video. It's kind of hard trying to speak out loud while you're doing this like because when I'm in my head, I get to do it a lot more quickly. But if there are any questions or if something was unclear, feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks for watching.